We're going to start with basic introduction. What is heat transfer? Why are we studying it? Lecture one. And it is the 25th. Okay. So I think it's helpful to kind of introduce a new topic in the context of um, a topic that you're familiar with. So in this case, um, thermo. And we'll go through kind of how heat transfer is similar and different from thermo and how they're related qualitatively and mathematically. Um, so I'm assuming that you've all had thermo. Is that right? Probably like last year. Yeah. Okay. So in general, thermo is interested in looking at how energy is transferred into and out of a system, so between a system and its surroundings. Um, and there are two kind of major ways that that's done, or two kind of major modes. Do you all know, do you remember what comes into and out of a system in thermo? Work and heat. Yes, beautiful. So we'll summarize for thermo. Energy is transferred between a system and its surroundings, both directions, <coughs> by work and heat, Q. And for thermo, we're primarily inter interested in kind of the state of the system before and after the, you know, work has occurred or heat has gone into or out of the system. Um, so, you know, how, what is the system doing before, then we're going to um, you know, add work and heat, and then what is the system doing afterwards? So we're interested in the before and the after. Um, but with heat transfer, we're really interested in how heat is being transferred. Um, so kind of the modes of heat transfer, and then also how quickly it's being transferred, so the rate. So how heat is going into a system and how quickly it's going into a system. Transferred. So the modes. And then how quickly it's transferred. So the rate of heat transfer. Okay, um, so I think I feel like when you're you know learning a topic, it's always useful to understand why you're studying that topic. So the motivation. Um, there are plenty of applications of heat transfer. You're probably familiar with quite a few of them already. Um, but basically, systems and devices that you use every day, cars, personal computers, you know, supercomputers. Maybe you don't use supercomputers every day, but someone does. Um, data centers, those basically all generate heat, excess waste heat by operation. And if there weren't systems in place to remove that heat, it would be detrimental to the operation of you know, the computer or the car or whatever. Um, and there's plenty more applications, but in general, I've found that you know, even if you don't end up directly, you know, if you're you know, research or job or whatever, um, directly related to heat transfer, you're probably going to end up needing to know and use some, um, you know, some topics to do with heat transfer in whatever you do. So, for example, Abby and I run our turbine experiments in an experimental flume, and to have like really repeatable performance um, with our turbines, we need to have the water temperature held like really exactly so that the Reynolds number is the same. Um, and the pumps put heat into the water, and it's you know continually changing. So to run our fluids experiments, we had to design a heat exchanger that we could put in the flume and basically figure out you know, how big it should be, what we should run, it, run through it, what temperature it should be at, um, and how to control it so that we could hold the temperature of the water for our fluids experiments like at precisely what temperature we wanted. So you know, even if you're not directly doing something related to heat transfer, you're probably going to end up working with it in, in some way. Um, so 
We'll start with some definitions to just kind of lay out the basic ideas of um, the concepts that we'll be working with here. So you all probably know there are three types of energy, kinetic, potential, internal. We're going to be talking a lot about internal energy in this class. And that basically has to do with the microscopic energy of a system. So kinetic energy you know, has to do with the kind of bulk motion of something, potential energy, the energy that something has from gravity. Um, and then internal energy is like what energy the system has microscopically, so you can't see it. So microscopic energy. And there are several different types of internal energy. Um, the primary ones that the book at least is interested in um, are sensible. So that has to do with the um, kind of microscopic motions of the atoms and the molecules. So the translations, rotations, vibrations, and I think that's what you typically think of as internal energy. It's actually just one type of internal energy. Um, So translations, etc., of the molecules and atoms. And then there's latent, um, which has to do with the energy of phase changes. There is a section in the book that specifically covers um, like boiling and condensation that we probably will not get to, but that is mostly where you would be concerned with latent energy in this class. Chemical, so the energy in the chemical bonds. And then nuclear. Um, and that has to do with forces in the nucleus. Okay. So heat transfer often refers to thermal energy, which is really just the sensible component plus the latent component. Thank you. I will try to pay more attention to that. Plus the latent component of internal energy. So that's U thermal equals U sensible plus U latent, where U is just the symbol for internal energy. Um, and then to simplify it kind of even further, heat transfer, at least for the purposes of this class, is often we're often going to be talking about only the sensible component. So it's kind of helpful as we're going through problems and such to realize what we're like physically talking about here. You know, we're talking about heat, energy going from one object to another or moving throughout one object. Um, and that is related to um, you know, the, the motions of the molecules and atoms on a really small scale, and those basically translating energy. Um, so at a lower ener energy level, basically you'll just have less energetic motions, and at a higher energy level, you'll have more energetic motions. Um, and so anytime, you know, you have an imbalance in the energy of something, it's going to try and come to equilibrium. So you basically have energy being transferred from the area where there are more energetic motions to the area where there are less. Uh, the next definition, temperature, is something that is often confused with heat. Um, and temperature is just a way that we measure the internal energy of a system. So it's not energy itself, um, but it's just a measure of the internal energy. So basically a measure of, you know, how energetic 
translations, rotations, vibrations at a microscopic scale are. And then with all of these um, kind of concepts, we can put together a definition of what heat transfer actually is. And I like this definition, it's pretty concise. It's thermal energy in transit due to a spatial temperature difference. So this all makes sense, it's all consistent if we think about it. Um, so you know, you have an object and maybe one side of it is held at a colder temperature and one side is held at a, held at a hot, higher temperature. So that means the temperature is indicating there's gonna be less internal energy on this side, more internal energy on this side, and it's gonna naturally try and come to equilibrium. So that's gonna be that thermal energy moving through the object from the hotter side to the colder side. So basically if you have a temperature difference you will have heat transfer, um, usually, unless something is perfectly insulated. Um, and if you don't have a temperature difference, you won't have heat transfer. Good to keep in mind. Pretty simple, but it's kind of the driving force behind all of this. Okay, um, any questions on this? Yes? Um, so how is like temperature different from sensible energy? Because you say it's like internal energy, but temperature doesn't include things like chemical or um, so I don't think temperature includes things like sensible and nuclear. It's basically just a measure of the internal energy. Does that make sense? So like if you think about the way temperature is measured, um, or like classically, I guess, if you have, you know, like the mercury, mercury thermometer or whatever, and if you stick it in something that has a certain temperature, then it's the mercury is going to come into thermal equilibrium with the you know pot of water or whatever and so the water molecules are going to be transmitting energy to that mercury and that's going to cause it to like rise up in the tube and so we've just you know calibrated okay it's rising this much up in the tube but that corresponds to a temperature of like 80 degrees or whatever does that make sense yeah cool anything else okay um, the book does have a little section on like units and dimensions. I'm not going to cover that. I feel like you guys probably are familiar. We're just going to work in the metric system in this class because um, it's not annoying, and <laughs> um, we'll be let's be modern. Um, <laughs> but there, the book does have a on the back cover has a list of like conversion factors and physical constants, and I posted those on the resources folder in Canvas. And doing homework, I would like you to try and use like the specific values that are listed in the book. It's just easier for us to grade if everyone is using like the same conversion factors as we're going through. Okay. All right. So let's switch now to talking about more specifically how heat transfer is related to thermodynamics. So. We'll start, I don't know, a little new section here. And specifically, we're going to talk about the relationship to the first law of thermodynamics. So what does the first law say? Right, it's just the conservation of energy, energy accounting. So it says that the total energy of a system is conserved.
And so that means that energy, the energy of a system can only change if energy is crossing its boundaries, the total energy of a system. Um, so typically when we talk about, you know, the first law and thermo, we make a distinction between closed systems and open systems. Um, so for a closed system, energy is transferred only via work and heat. So you basically have a system that has a material boundary, you know, a solid boundary that has a fixed amount of mass, so you don't have mass coming in or out, and you just have energy being transferred um, via work and heat. Um, and kind of the like, you know, classic illustration that you have of a closed system, it's like this generic blob, it's like heat going in, work coming out. And then you have the change in the total stored energy of the system. And then mathematically, it's written like this. So the change in the total, it, total stored energy of the system is equal to what's coming in, the energy coming in, minus the energy going out. Um, and you probably remember from thermo, we just have it defined as heat in and work out. But if, you know, it can be reversed if work is going into the system, it's just a negative. So then you have Q plus work. So you end up with a total positive into the system. Okay. I'm going to try to go to the next page, like leave this up there a little bit. Okay. Um, so that's closed system. And then for an open system, you don't actually have any material boundaries, any solid boundaries. You're basically just defining a volume and you're just kind of picking an arbitrary surface that defines the edges of the volume. And then you're basically accounting for the energy in that volume. So again, you can have heat and work move in and out, uh, transport, transport energy. And then you can also have mass come in and out of the volume. And mass is going to you know, necessarily conduct energy with it. So now you have to account for not only the work and the heat being done, but also the energy that's coming in with the mass and the energy that's leaving with the mass that leaves. Um, so let's say energy can be transferred via work, heat, and that's called advection, mass flowing in and out. So again, kind of the generic system blob um, with dashed lines this time to show that it's not a fixed solid boundary. Heat in, work out, and now we have energy being advected in and energy being advected out. And again, that's going to be equal to the change in the total stored energy. Q minus W plus energy advected. And here, we're just saying that this is the net energy advected. So accounting for you know, what's coming in minus what's going out in that one term.
Okay, these definitions are all useful for thermodynamics because you're interested in kind of the total energy of the system. But in general, for heat transfer, we're only going to be looking at kind of, um, you know, specific types of energy. So kind of subsets of the total energy. So we'll need to have a slightly different definition of the first law um, for heat transfer. So for thermo, for thermo, we care about kinetic, potential, and internal energy. But for heat transfer, we're only interested in specific types. So I think it's easiest if you just kind of lay out all the types of energy. Because they all have different names. Combinations of them have different names. So kinetic, potential, internal. And then like we said before, sensible, sensible latent, chemical, etc. There's also other types of internal energy, like electrical energy is counted as internal energy. Um, but for this case, we're just interested typically in the sensible and latent, which is thermal, and then kinetic and potential, which is mechanical. So for the first law purposes um, for heat transfer, thermal and mechanical energy. Okay. So we'll make a kind of slight modification to our first law. The first law for heat transfer. So change in the stored energy. So notice that this is not the total stored energy because we are not accounting for the total energy in um, uh, for heat transfer. We're just interested in mechanical and thermal. So that's the change in the mechanical energy plus the change in the thermal energy. I guess I should note here that this is thermal energy, which I'll usually call U sub T. And then if we break it all the way down, that's kinetic plus potential plus sensible plus latent. And just like before, that's going to be equal to the total energy that we have coming in which could come from work, heat, or advection. Total energy going out, again, from work, heat, or advection. But we're going to have a new term here, energy generation. So the distinction here is we're not accounting for the total energy. So there could be, um, in the system, there could occur some conversion of uh, for example, chemical energy to either mechanical or thermal. So for the purposes of our accounting, this looks like energy generation because we're only keeping track of the mechanical and the thermal energy. And that could go both ways. So it could be positive or negative energy generation. So thermal energy could be converted to chemical energy, in which case it would look like an energy loss in the system. Um, so we're going to say this is actually conversion from other types of energy that we aren't particularly interested in keeping track of. Okay, and so this is specifically, well, change in mechanical and thermal. It's right there. I won't call it out specifically. Okay.
Does that make sense? All right. So if we want to draw our system for heat transfer, energy in, energy out, stored energy, and now energy generation. And if we want to simplify it even further, typically with the problems we're going to be working on, the kinetic and potential energy and latent energy changes are all going to be negligible. So we're often going to be working just with changes in the sensible energy. There's no bell, so we need to keep track of the time. Okay. <coughs> okay. Any questions on that? So from thermal, you're probably used to seeing the first law in a couple different forms. So this is looking at um, kind of like the total energy transferred. Um, but we also are interested often in looking at it on a rate basis. Um, so this would be looking at like energy in joules. And we're also interested in the transfer of energy in joules per second, so watts. Um, so you can just as easily write this um, on a rate basis, which if we just write out the full definition is just the time derivative So kind of the instantaneous change in the energy in the, in the system. Yes. Generated. Yeah, so this is, let's see, I've got it up here as conversion. So I can put parentheses, energy generated. So it's basically energy that is coming from another form of energy that we're not interested in, like chemical energy, into thermal or mechanical energy. So it looks like energy generation, even though it's just energy conversion. Okay. And then kind of a special particular application um, that will result in an even simpler form of the first law is if you have just a surface balance. So say you have a wall that's held at some temperature and then you've got you know some air flowing over it and you want to look at, you know, define your control volume as being just the very uh, surface of the wall. Can you look at this form of the equation and tell me like which, val like which terms are just going to drop out? 
automatically if you're looking just at the surface. So that it's you know infinitesimally close to the edge, so you don't have a volume. There's no mass. Right. So there's going to be no energy generation if there's no mass in the control volume. And then if there's no mass, you're also not going to be able to store energy. So for a surface, the first law is just going to reduce to the energy in, the rate of energy in equals the rate of energy out. Okay, that's basically it. Summary of the first law, relationship to thermodynamics. For heat transfer, we're interested in how the heat is transferred, how quickly it's transferred, and we have a slightly different form of the first law because we only care about certain types of energy. It's kind of the summary. Okay, so now we have three more minutes and we'll start talking about the modes of heat transfer what we're really here to learn. So this is basically looking at, you know, how does heat transfer, how does energy transfer occur? And there are three main types. Conduction, convection, and radiation. So conduction is applicable when you have heat that is being transferred in a stationary medium. So there's no bulk motion. And this could be, you know, it's kind of confusing to think about because typically you think about convection occurring with a fluid, but conduction can occur with a solid or a fluid. It just has to be stationary, a stationary solid or a stationary fluid. So there's no bulk motion of either object. So conduction occurs in a stationary medium. Solid or fluid. And then convection is heat transfer that occurs between a surface and a moving fluid. So you have like a wall with, you know, wind going past it or flow going past it. And then radiation um, basically occurs regardless of the medium. And so that is, we have you know, two surfaces and it's basically electromagnetic waves that both of the surfaces are emitting. So anything with a finite temperature is gonna emit electro electromagnetic waves. Um, and so they don't depend on like a specific medium to be transferred. And so that's heat transfer between two surfaces in the form of electromagnetic waves. So electromagnetic waves, no intervening medium. Okay, that's a decent place.